Out of the Ordinary Insights, brought to you by Investec Specialist Bank. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Captains of Industry. My name is Kukuletu Mfupi. Today we have the honor of speaking to Brett Kimber. He's the chief executive of Afrox, uh, otherwise known as African Oxygen. Brett, thank you so much for coming, uh, or rather for allowing us to come today. Great seeing you. Perhaps uh, for some of our African viewers who might not be familiar with the company, who is Afrox? Well, Afrox, we're part of the Linda Group. It's a, a industrial gas company um, based here in South Africa, and we also support 13 countries in emerging Africa. So oxygen, nitrogen, LPG, uh, carbon dioxide. So those are our key products. A lot of uh, chemicals and gases that you mentioned there. But uh, coming back to your leadership position, I understand you've been at the, on the job for a little over 18 months. Uh, it's, how's the ride been so far? Well, the ride here back in South Africa has been um, interesting, tremendous. I uh, started my career in the gas industry here at Afrox for eight years and then went overseas for 15 years with a group. Uh, so coming back was to actually try and help turn the company around because uh, economically and structurally it had uh, fallen behind the trends in the world. So it's been very interesting sort of building back the basics and now sort of positioning it for growth going forward. Let's touch on your international travels. I understand you spent some time in Singapore, the US, as well as Korea. What were some of the highlights uh, that you that you picked up from some of those nations? Well, the US, it was a culture shock. I think uh, you feel when you go to a place like that, that it'll be very similar. Uh, Singapore and Korea wasn't a culture shock because I think there you know they're going to be different and, and you don't expect it. So, but business-wise, the U.S., we did the whole of North and South America, so that was very interesting to see that. That was in the late 90s, early 2000s, so booming times in the U.S. I then moved to Singapore to head up the electronics part of um, the BOC group in there. And that was fascinating because really you had Sam Samsung Electronics, TSMC, taking over the world as far as um, the dom becoming the dominant suppliers. So actually trying to win business with them and working with them culturally to understand that they do business on a handshake and a relationship. Mm. And you know, Samsung Electronics awarded us 50% of their future business at one particular site. Normally you get a five to 10 year contract. That 50% of future business, is it 20 years? Is it 50 years? Is it 100 years? So it was a very different sort of um, way of working in business and, and leadership style with those different nations. I'd like us to zone in on that perhaps. Uh, you touched on the culture shock issue, especially in the US. Uh, what was so different about that environment there? Well, I think uh, they are both men and women are working. Um, they are driven very much around the work. So South Africa, I think, has a much better balance um, when it comes to work, family, friendship, lifestyle around sport. Um, they what don't have, as a, a generalization, people to their homes. They will rather meet in a restaurant um, and it's 6.30 to 8.30 and then you go home. So for us, that was a big change from being a social. Yes, we didn't have family there, but we just noticed that was a big difference, that it was so work-driven um, that they didn't have much of a social side. It changed. We were there during 9-11 and there was more empathy and more um, community involvement and support. But generally in America, they don't know who their neighbours are. So in South Africa, we should continue enjoying our brides, I take Absolutely, it. Absolutely. And watching yes. the rugby on Saturdays. And, you know, enjoying uh, a beer while you're watching it, which uh, in America, it's a little too serious, I think, sometimes. Mm. Uh, when we were looking at uh, one of the lovely boards that you have here in your office, uh, you were highlighting the issues that you experienced with uh, the unions in Korea. Walk us through that. So Korea's got a very strong history from the point of view in the 70s. They were a poor nation. This is South Korea. They were as poor as North Korea is now. But they had a dictator who became what I call a benevolent dictator who said, we need to develop this country. So worked with business, clear focus. This is where electronics needs to be, steel, here, car manufacturing, shipbuilding. But because business and government worked together, some of the labor was left behind. And 
post the Olympics, um, the union started to say, you've got to start sharing some of this wealth. So they had the Olympics in, in 1988. So between there and um, in the early 2000s, when sort of we started our business, um, we had acquired some assets during the financial crisis, some, some of the petrochemicals, and a union members came across. The rest of our company wasn't unionized. So we had the challenge of trying to convince the unions that we were fair payers and that they were part of the family of, of the Linda Group there. So to do that, we said, this is our vision. They unfortunately said, no, we like the way we operate today. So we don't want any changes. So we had to prepare for a strike. And we went through a very painful period of 100 days where that site was on strike. But the Korean government and the security side work with companies to make sure that infrastructure is, remains safe. And you've got to, when you have a demonstration, say where and how many people, and the security comes and provides assistance. So we went through that period, but at the end of it, the union members, because they then felt that, right, they had not succeeded, they flipped from being union members to becoming company loyal employees. And now we just have this incredible harmony in the organization. So while it was a difficult period, as a company, we're so much better off and Korea is going through that um, with many sort of instances. But that 100 day period, you have to be able to survive. Um, and it's a very challenging period to manage that where you've got your customers, are you going to be able to carry on summer? You've got the rest of your employees, you've got some empathy. So you have to keep communication and what you're trying to achieve clear to everyone. Mm. I find that uh, such a remarkable story, especially given the labor situation that we have here in South Africa. We have a strike for at least three weeks that it costs companies millions, and we're not appropriately prepared for, for, for such ventures. Uh, what do you make at the moment of the, of the labor strife that we're experiencing in the country? Well, if I could step back and just say, I think from, again, looking at it from a career, Korean perspective, they have gone from being very poor in the 70s to one of the leading nations now. I put it down to clear leadership, strong work ethic, and competitiveness. Hmm. Now I think to address your question, if we say, where is South Africa competitive? What do we have? You know, we've got the minerals, we've got the potential to have cheap electricity and beneficiate. If you come at it from that side and say, South Africa, you better compete against Brazil and India, they and the rest of Africa. If we do that, the pie gets bigger. Then we can share it with everyone. So for me, we really need to be able to have a clear vision and then work towards it. And we said, tomorrow is going to be better than t today and better educated people, better jobs, then we can share it. But if you're trying to share up a shrinking pie of smaller benefits from the mining industry, it is going to be a challenge and it's going to be painful. So that's where I see you've got to have the roadmap that says we can all benefit by working together rather than fighting for a short-term gain. And I understand, you know, really South Africa has a history where the difference between rich and poor is so stark. But if you can get the pie bigger, you can actually share it quicker. Do you believe we have that plan in the pipeline at the moment? I don't think we have that vision and that leadership that says, and I do think there have been times in South Africa recently where we have done it successfully, the tourism industry. Mm. Clearly there was a concerted effort to do that. But I think the mining industry, the, we, we can, and, and I'm a member of Business Leadership of South Africa, and we are working with government now to say, if we can address just five key areas, you know, education, infrastructure, policy, those type of things can help the partnership to get South Africa going. But for me, it's that competitiveness. Can we say, mm -hmm. as a nation, we've got products, services, we used to, we had the strongest mining houses in the world. South African Breweries is an example of one that's still taken our capabilities and our leadership and is influencing the world. Mm -hmm. 
Then as a chief executive of, of such a huge company with such great opportunities, how do you maintain positivity? How do you remain enthusiastic, given the fact that uh, the, the South African economic picture doesn't look so bright at the moment? Small wins, getting a little bit of momentum and bringing a team along with you. So just that positivity which comes from successes. So if you can say those are good examples in the in individual's work area, in the company work area, in the country, it all can generate uh, you know, the right momentum. So that's what I do within where we are. To motivate people and communicate, you communicate where the successes are and where we are moving forward positively. One of the other issues that you touched on is education. And I understand you've got a string of degrees behind your name. So clearly that's a stance that you're also quite passionate about, uh, in particular in a specialised industry like yours. Well, I think it's a life journey, education. Um, I came from a simple background in growing up in KwaZulu-Natal. I fortunately was sent to good education called Wallace Michael House, where there they show you that with hard work, with teamwork, um, drive, planning, you can actually achieve things. So passion to learn, so it was just different degrees to broaden my perspective. You know, my natural aptitudes lay in the sciences, but to do economics and, and psychology as part-time just to, to broaden your knowledge. And also I wanted to get global experience. So it's, it's, it's a life journey that I haven't stopped learning. And from a skill set perspective, uh, is South Africa lacking when it comes to the industry that you delve in? Very true. I mean, that is one of the things I did notice coming back is to succeed, you've got to have the right people in the right jobs. And the right people need to be skilled. Mm -hmm. And South Africa, you know, in our industry, yes, you have applications, you have safety you've got to worry about. It's a complex business to be able to service the customer. So it doesn't come. You can't just sort of say, go and do that. It takes a lot of development. And Afrox has been providing education support to our employees, to their children, um, bursas out. So Afrox has been passionate. You know, we've been around for 86 years, passionate about education. And we do support welding schools, creches, supply LPG to them. So we try and help with the community development as well. Mm. Fantastic story. Well, we will continue following up and learning more about the man behind Afrox, and that is the MD and Chief Executive of the Welcome back to Captains of Industry, where this week we're speaking to Brett Kimber, who's the MD and Chief Executive of the Afrox Group. Brett, before the ad break, we touched on the importance of education, but I want to focus on the company a little bit further now and your African expansion projects. You, you're very bullish about uh, the, the opportunities that are presented out there, but naturally there are some challenges. But uh, what could we see from Afrox in the next couple of years regarding your African strategy? Interesting you say that because when I came back um, and often you see Africa in the centre of the world map and then you have these grand plans in international companies, what they're doing in Asia, the Americas and maybe a little bit in South Africa and the rest of the map is just blank. Yeah. And I said to our teams here and globally, we've got to fill Africa, give it some colour with investment plans. So we have, we've worked actively and we have a 10 year plan now. As I said earlier, we're in 13 countries north of here. So we're going to invest. Yes, it's going to be small investments initially on the back of the platforms we've got, but we believe um, the demographics, the infrastructure, the mining support will grow those economies. And we're going to grow hopefully ahead of those to be able to meet the customers. So we've got a very clear plan. Um, my team sort of said an interesting thing. It took nine months to prepare, 90 minutes to clean up, sorry, 90 days to clean up, 90 minutes to prepare, and 90 seconds to get approved. And I said, yes, you thought you had 10 years to execute. You've only got nine years to execute. So we do have some good plans there, um, as well as obviously developing South Africa. I'm happy to hear that you're an optimist on the Africa rising story, but certainly there are some barriers to trade, uh, you know, regulatory uncertainty, political instability in some countries. How do you manage those kind of risks? We, let's use Zimbabwe, for example. So you've got, obviously, its legacy recently as far as sort of being an underperforming economy. 
Um, you've then got um, you know, their policies which are trying. Yet we've got a very strong business there. So now we need to protect that. And then in other countries, like Kenya, we've been there since 1937. So we understand the history. So we're not there for a quick um, investment. One of the advantages of a gas company like ours, we're not the primary mining investor. We're the secondary supplier to those. So the red tape and everything else is a lot easier for us. So we're following companies. And then we build a facility and we supply to multiple companies. So yes, we understand the risks, but because we've been around for so long, we have local managers who understand it. What I'm now going to do is support with the global skills processes and infrastructure to help those local teams see the opportunities and, uh, and then invest ahead of the megatrends. There's a lot of oil and gas in East Africa and West Africa. Um, and as I say, as those nations become wealthier, there's going to be consumer, Coca-Cola for example, big investors, that needs carbon dioxide. Mm. How, how difficult has it been for you to uh, support, or rather not gain support for, for investor confidence in the company, especially since you took over about 18 months ago when your predecessor, Chart Kruger, left the company? Again, I think both for my team in South Africa and for management in um, Germany now with the Linda Group, you have to have a track record of investing and delivering. And I think both customers as well, when they know you've got a team that understands their requirement and has a track record. Chart came from outside the industry and I think just the fact that I've been in the industry for 25 years, worked around the world, gives a certain amount of credibility. So I've been able to get the investment support and as we say, the Emerging Africa Strategy, we worked with the Linda Group Strategy Group to clean it up. So when we presented it, we knew it was going to get the support. And so it's building that trust and credibility and then delivering on it. Mm. Well, you certainly uh, didn't grow up perhaps wanting to be a chief executive. Uh, you're a young boy, as you mentioned, growing up in KZN. Uh, paint a picture for us uh, regarding your childhood. You know, what was your typical experience like as a boy? Well, I grew up uh, as a son of a dairy farmer um, in Greytown. Um, no great shakes, just a, just a very fine gentleman, very supportive family. As I said, I had the opportunity to go to the finest education institutions in places like my class and that shape, shapes your values, your competitiveness, your drive and the, the, the other boys that were there with you, it, it starts a network um, and that old boys network is very strong. What it taught me is that teamwork and relationships are very important. So whereas I had very simple aspirations, just get a degree, right? I joined Anglo-American, the research labs here in Johannesburg, and very quickly I was asked to help some of their challenging areas. And in being able to take on a challenge and work through resistance and stick through it to the, the end, see it through, I suppose for me that was, and, and feeling the rewards when you've actually bought a team and you've sorted it out, was something that then said, okay, one, I like the challenge, two, I seem to have the tenacity and, and able to work with teams to resolve those. And then I felt I needed to get into the real world of where true customers are. And, and so took the opportunity to join Afrox. My family thought I was crazy, leaving the mine, you know, mining house like Anglo-American and joining a gas company. But uh, there were real challenges and I, I, I wanted to feel what it was like selling products. And you know, we supply oxygen to a baby in an incubator, to an old person who's you know, to steel industry. So it's just that breadth of industries that I wanted a new challenge. And I think that's really um, what has always happened in my career is, here's a challenge, please take it on. And the fact that you can get it done through teamwork comes from that simple, Growing up, that you know, a place like my class says, you've got to be a member of a team. You've got to play a team sport. It's got to be the school. It's got to be for everyone's benefit. That that ethos is just uh, carried through, and how I work with people. Mm. 
Something else that's very interesting is how you perhaps stay on top of your game when there's a new change or new revolution. And perhaps we're in the digital age now uh, where technology is, you know, at the forefront of everything. And you also have new innovation that you're developing at your company. If you could walk us through that and show us some of the new yeah, nifty gadgets and, uh, that you've innovated. I think that is critical in any business, even if one that's 86 years old and it's got simple projects, you products, you have to be able to be innovative and, and support customers. So, Afrox has a strong hard goods business where we make uh, equipment for cylinders to supply. And if I can just show that uh, this was technology which has been around for 50 years, where you, we call it the Mickey Mouse, where you've got the two mm. valves on top. But we proudly are, this is South African designed from our team here at Afrox. Afrox is the only manufacturing division within the Linda Group worldwide. When I came back, people thought maybe we would actually shut it down because of China. But the fact that we've got the capability to design and develop products like this, mm -hmm. the Linda Group now is proud of our capabilities. And this product, we showed it in the Essen um, show in Germany last year, it attracted an incredible amount of interest. So he has a little South African division that's going to be manufacturing products that will go worldwide. It is just so cutting it, it'll also be able to link with computers in future. So your welder will, he'll have a visor which will have an LCD screen, so he won't need to look at the weld anymore. Not even a laptop or a tablet? No, it will be the, there will be a camera on his visor that will watch it and it'll pick up the temperature and the gas and the, the welding torch will be talking through the computer and that will help him. So that's the future. Proudly South African. Very proudly South African, very proudly Afrox. And uh, we also manufacture for the mining industry these rescue packs, which keeps the miners safe in, in emergency. They would open this and they would be able to breathe oxygen through, through that material. So we have manufacturing of that and that we sell worldwide. So yes, this little company in South Africa, part of the Lindy Group, actually is cutting edge. I can see why you're optimistic about the future regarding that. But uh, I want your take on what you make of renewable energy. You know, there's talks about shale gas uh, as well as other forms of, of renewable energy coming on board. Would that have an impact on your business? Absolutely. So today we supply the majority of the market on LPG. We're having to import LPG. Um, so we see worldwide the advantage of the, um, the gas revolution. I think for South Africa, and you know, obviously I studied geology as one of my um, majors when I was at varsity, I know there's a significant amount of gas in the Karoo. We just have to get past the environmentalists and actually come up with, again, a vision to use that because then you could get cheaper power, then you could get chemical plants, create an incredible amount of jobs in South Africa. The risk is Mozambique and Tanzania have good gas. The risk is that they develop it quicker and enough gas can come in via pipeline, extending what we've got around, and South Africa doesn't need that gas. We can use theirs. So for me, it's this race. Who's going to do it first? There is so much gas in East Africa now that South Africa and, and East Africa is going to benefit in the next 20 to 30 years. So clearly whoever catches that um, bo bone first then might be the winner in the long term. Correct. So we're positioning ourselves for what we call the mega trend. So you've got environmental issues and you've got the oil and gas um, which is coming and I believe there will be oil discovered off the coast of South Africa as well. It's just deeper but uh, you've got exploration going on there. So it could change the face as long as we position ourselves and take advantage of it and don't drag our heels and then the rest of the world produces and there is no need for our product. Brett, I find it fantastic that you've got this wonderful vision for the company, but uh, perhaps if you look back on your legacy one day, what would you like to be known for? Well, I, I would say that for me, just influencing an organization and influencing a country indirectly through our products is something that I would be um, wanted to just know as this individual helped. And when I came back to Afrox, I said, we're 85 years old. Every decision I'm making is 
that we are stronger today when we turn 100. So it is about long-term positioning for our company, for the country, for our customers to just help it. So just want to be recognized as someone who contributed a little bit. Well, from our discussion, I can tell that you're a visionary, someone who's on the brink of technology and innovation and also passionate about Africa. Thank you so much for your time today, Preet. Well, that does bring